What's wrong with DBX? Specifically, DBX noise reduction. I'm not talking about any other DBX equipment or processors. Firstly, in case you're thinking I made a typo in this video's title, it is DBX all in lowercase. Yes, it's stupid because it makes anyone who writes it like that look as though they're stupid. <laughs> but that's the way it is. I'm going to use it correctly. Well, I'll try despite any autocorrect in my script. So what's the problem that it's meant to solve? Noise. Noise in a tape recording, both reel-to-reel -reel and cassette, or professional and amateur recording, if I can put it that way. The problem is that analogue tape recording is noisy, and it would be nice not to have to put up with the noise. To be fair, professional reel-to-reel -reel tape running at 15 inches per second is acceptable for many purposes. Even at half of that speed, still not too bad, particularly if you have a Nagra recorder. But compact cassette, to give the format its full name. Well, it wasn't designed for high-quality reproduction. But you know, crazy scientists and engineers do crazy things, and they tried their best to create such a thing as a hi-fi cassette deck. Their best, unfortunately, wasn't particularly good, at first because of the noise. But then kind Mr Ray Dolby came along and gave us his Type B noise reduction system. That worked really well despite what people who can't be bothered to clean their cassette decks say. Finally, we had truly hi-fi compact cassette. Dolby Type B came along in 1968, not long after the professional Type A. It's simplified compared to Type A, but effective, giving a 9 decibel signal-to-noise ratio improvement, a little more, at higher frequencies. It takes cassette from really not good enough to good enough for most people to enjoy music without the distraction of noise. I'll just say again, because so many people disrespected and still do disrespect Dolby Type B unfairly. If you keep your cassette deck's heads and other important parts clean, and if you use the recommended brand and type of tape, you will enjoy noise-free music with no problems. But 9dB, measured according to DIN recommendation 45405. Well, that's not really very ambitious, is it? It'll reduce the noise, but not eliminate it. And so... In 1971, David E. Blackmer came up with DBX. You can see where the D and the B come from, and I guess that the X comes from dynamic range expansion. The signal-to-noise ratio of cassette is often given as 45 dB, and I think this is a reasonable figure to work with. Clearly, different decks and different tapes will be better or worse, but 45 dB is about right. So Dolby Type B can elevate this to 54 dB, about the same as a vinyl record. This, as I said, is a workable improvement, but it doesn't eliminate noise. So what can dBx do for us that Dolby can't? What about 90 dB, a signal-to-noise ratio of 90 decibels? Or some of this potential signal-to-noise ratio can be traded for extra headroom before the tape starts to distort. At this point, we have CD-like quality, at least in terms of raw figures. Does noise from a CD ever trouble you? No, not unless it's a CD version of a historical recording or something's gone badly wrong in mastering. So here we have a kind of holy grail, compact cassette without the noise. So how does this magic happen? Well, let me go back to Dolby for a moment. Dolby Type B works by boosting low-level, high-frequency components on record, then lowering them on playback, which also lowers the noise from the analog magnetic recording process. That's simplifying, but it's the essence. Dolby Type B doesn't try to be too ambitious. The aim is to reduce the noise without creating other problems. Which it does, if you keep your heads clean and use the right tape. DBX, on the other hand, uses a powerful 2 to 1 compression ratio before recording, followed by 2 to 1 expansion on playback. This applies right across the frequency range and at all levels. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but not much. In both Dolby and DBX, the aim is to keep the signal level above the noise level so that the signal, the music, always masks the noise. This will happen already when the signal level is high. When the signal level is low, this is when noise reduction earns its keep. So what advantages does DBX have over Dolby Type B? Well, firstly, clearly there's massively more noise reduction, which leads to both greater dynamic range and headroom. Also, DBX applies compression and expansion across the full dynamic range, 
where Dolby Type-B only boosts low-level signals. This creates a tracking issue in Dolby. If levels coming back off tape are not exactly what the system expects, there will be either more or less expansion than there should be, and this will vary with frequency. The usual problem when you use the wrong tape or don't clean the heads is that the sound is dull. This is why many people really do prefer to leave the Dolby button switched out, even though the tape was recorded with it switched in. This is 100% wrong, but if people like it, then they like it. DBX is not without its own tracking problems, but subjectively it's less of an issue than Dolby. So if you use the wrong type of tape, or don't clean your heads, DBX doesn't seem to mind so much as Dolby does. My experience, your mileage may vary. So it seems that DBX is the clear winner. Less noise, more headroom, more dynamic range, less of a tracking issue. So <laughs> why did just about every hi-fi cassette deck ever made have a Dolby button, not a DBX? <laughs> well, clearly there's marketing, licensing, business stuff like that. But is there any technical reason? Yes, and it's a monster. DBX causes modulation noise. Modulation noise is noise that varies in level according to the level of the signal. It's present in all forms of analogue tape recording, even without noise reduction, at a low level. But DBX causes its own version of modulation noise that's as plain as day, or as plain as the nose on my face through this fairly wide-angle lens. You might call it noise pumping, which is something that happens with ordinary compression. But I hear it as modulation noise because it's closely tied to the signal. When did I first notice this? When I bought my DBX Type 2 unit to use with my fairly good cassette deck back in around 1980. By chance, one of the first recordings I made with it was a copy of a recording of classical piano music. I can't remember whether I sourced that from vinyl, FM radio, or whether it was a recording I'd made myself. It could have been any. Also, by chance, piano is probably the one instrument that shows up the problem of DBX to the greatest extent. I found the experience unlistenable. Yes, there was less noise overall, but when I could hear the noise, I could hear it varying with the signal level, note by note. Rather than steady state noise, which is possible to get used to and ignore to an extent, this kind of noise just keeps drawing attention to itself, and I simply couldn't get past that. What was weird though, and I say this in favour of DBX, is when the cassette started to play, before the music itself started, there was no noise, just inky black silence. I'd never heard that before, not on reel-to-reel -reel tape, even with Dolby Type-A noise reduction, FM radio with a decent aerial, vinyl with a new record, or cassette with Dolby Type-B noise reduction. With DBX, there was nothing. It wasn't until Compact Disc came along that I heard such nothingness again. And, of course, it's universal now, we sometimes don't appreciate how lucky we are. So that was that, my thorough, no holds barred disrecommendation for DBX. So why did I come to use it again? <laughs> well, though I'd been trained on Pro Studio equipment and used Pro Studio equipment at work, I'd caught the home studio bug. This was when it was first practical to have and own a home studio rather than mess about on a Revox or the famous Akai 4000DS, which I had done previously. If you want to read about one of the true early pioneers of home studios, I'll recommend my own Sound on Sound article from November 1987. Link in the description. But that was a much higher high end than anything I could afford. <laughs> what I could afford was a Tascam Porter Studio, a four-track multi-track cassette deck. I say multi-track because it emulated a reel-to-reel -reel multi track in that you could record each track separately while monitoring in sync with what you'd recorded previously. In brief, the Tascam Porter Studio, I had the 244 model, combined a mixer, multi-track recorder with insert points to use compression or any other process, and aux outputs and inputs to add reverb or delay effects. And it had DBX noise reduction, type 2. Well, I knew exactly what I was letting myself in for, modulation noise. To be fair, the Tascam Porter Studio runs the tape at twice the normal speed, three and three quarter inches per second, 
rather than the normal 1 and 7 eighths. Clearly, this gives the Porter Studio a head start. And I wasn't going to be recording classical piano on it. My mind was set entirely on song demos, with the emphasis on demo. It may be worthwhile just saying for a moment what a demo is, or rather was. These days, to make any progress in your music career, you're expected to create masters suitable for commercial release, all in your own home studio, in your digital audio workstation software. OK, mixes, which will then go to a professional mastering engineer for fixing. <laughs> now, this is a whole other story, and I may take a look at this in a future video. But back in the 1980s, you could make a rough demo recording of your song, and if you could get anyone in the industry to listen to it, there'd be nothing holding you back from success. If the song is good, things happen. If the song is good and the recording is pretty terrible, doesn't matter, it's a demo. So my technical standards were not set all that high. If I could turn out something a little better than people were doing already using sound on sound techniques on their Revox, again, another story, then I'd be just fine. So I stopped worrying about it. I just made the best recordings I could and pestered people to listen to them. And no, history has not paid attention to my successful career as an artist or songwriter, mainly because there wasn't one. <laughs> but it wasn't the fault of DBX. No, I'm not going to make you listen to any of my demo songs. It's one thing suffering for one's art, but I don't see why my viewers should suffer too. I'll play out this video with an instrumental, though. Roland TR606 drum machine, ARP Axe synthesizer, Casio keyboard, my Fender guitar and a shaker of some kind, and the Tascam Porter Studio 244 with DBX. See you soon.